Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Patrick Kande, Governing Council Member of ICOG. I'm very happy to host some of the most leading practitioners in OBJYN for today's event. This is part of the TOG experience series, and today's program is focused on polycystic ovary syndrome, specifically what's new in both adolescent PCOS as well as the general management of PCOS in the light of the new HA guidelines that have been published. I'd like to welcome our two very eminent faculty who are here as chairpersons today. First and foremost, we have Dr. Varsha Basri, madam. Next slide, please. She is somebody who is well known to all of us. Recently, she has fought and won the Toxie Vice President election. But she's also known to us in fertility circles in Maharashtra as the first person who gave the C and PGD baby of North Maharashtra way back 20 years ago. She served as the president and secretary of the National Kobe Divine Society, of course. She's been chairperson for the Foxy International Academic Exchange Committee. She's received a host of awards, including the Among the Posti Puraskar by the Honorable Governor of Maharashtra, the Anandi Bai Joshi Award, the Foxy Champions Award, and she's also received the Foxy Excellence Award as a Foxy chairperson. Thank you, ma'am, for sparing time from your busy schedule to be here with us. Next slide, please. I'd also like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Tadmi Kaneja. She's been chairperson for the ISAR Delhi chapter. She's also the president of OBGYN Society, the PT State, scientific chairperson at several conferences which have been organized in and around Delhi. She's also a working member of the Figo Working Group on Breast Diseases. She's had a host of awards to her credit. She's also served as the chairperson for the Foxy Press Committee or almost 10 years back, president of the Muzaffar Nagar, the Bijivan Society, also president of IMA Muzaffar Nagar, Bharat Gaurav Samman Award, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Excellence Award, and a host of other awards as well. Most recently, she's won the Foxy Late Dr. D. Kutti Award which is a Lifetime Achievement Award, and I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Tarani Kanaja to our program. Our first speaker... Thank you so is, much, Pratik. Thank you so much. Yes. Our first speaker is a dear friend who I have known in fertility practice since several years, and she's somebody who is well known to all of us in fertility circles. She has actually come here simply because I have invited her. She's been refusing a lot of invitations going to be disease with practice as well as with her family. And thank you very much, Dr. Jyoti Bali, for being here with thank us. You. Can I refuse, request Dr. Varsha Basti to please introduce our first Yes. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be with you all. Dr. Pratik Tambe, I'm really obliged and honored by your invitation. And I'm really happy the TOG has taken a very apt subject, PCOS, and the topics also, the speakers also, like Dr. Jyoti Bali and Dr. Pratik Tambe. I'm really, really happy to attend this very, very important uh, uh, topic. And I'm really happy to be chairing the session along with Dr. Tarini Taneja, who is a known figure from Delhi. And Dr. Jholi, Jyoti Bali, a dear friend, and she has been into ART from since long. She is a director of Baby Soon Fertility and IV Center, Fellow Reproductive Medicine, Bangalore Assisted Conception Center, and Kamirira Hospital. Ex consultant, unit head, Fortis uh, Hospital, founder, secretary, Delhi Gaini Forum. Vice President, EGF Central Secretary, Delhi SAR in 2019-2020. Joint Secretary, National IMA Women Wing, recipient of Nang Shakti Award and 8th National Women Excellence Award. Pride of India Award for Expertise in, uh, in 2015. APJ Abdul Kalam Appreciation Award from Delhi Gaini Forum in 2018 she has received. And so she has received Economic Time Inspiring Gynecologist of North India Award 2018. So with this brief introduction, may I introduce Dr. Jyoti Bali, who is going to talk on PCOS. And we, let, we are really eager to um, uh, listen from you, uh, Dr. Jyoti Bali. Over to you. And thank you, organizers, again, for giving me the opportunity to be present in this August gathering. Thank you. 
thank you, Varsha, ma'am, for this kind introduction. And of course, I couldn't say no to Pratik, though for last one and a half years from my family commitments, I have not been able to go anywhere. No conference, no lectures. So, Pratik, thank you so yeah, much lucky. for the invite. <laughs> One second. Pratik always comes with a very good, nice, very good uh, topics and uh, excellent academician. I really love to attend all his topics and all his mm -hmm. webinars and whatever uh, academic Same programs. Here. I'm really Same here. Uh, highest of regards for this great academician and a good friend. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible, Pratik? Pratik? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. The topic uh, okay. today, Pratik had asked me to speak. Uh, on was adolescent PCOS and I think uh, my basic practice is for infertility so this segment I thought it, it is these girls if who are identified early tomorrow we see them into our practice so if counseled early detected early I think it will go a long way when we see them in our practice it will be their weight will be sorted out there are a lot of other issues which will be sorted out if they are you know picked up on time counseled on time and treated right from the beginning where it starts uh, why am I not able to? One second, Pratik. You can use the arrows on screen. Uh, one second, I'm calling somebody to help me out with this. There is no, no arrows. Right. Be comfortable. One second. Not moving at all. Control. One second. We had checked it. It was moving. Now it's not moving. Just give me one second. Yeah. So this PCOS, we all know that it's the, one of the most commonest uh, endocrine disorder. Incidence of PCOS is 8 to 13 percent in women. Why this varied range is there? Because, you know, it depends upon the ethnicity and the method of testing. And sometimes it is not really, you know, that we test this population. So we know. So the incidence reported in the literature is this gap that 8 to 13 percent. But with time and with technology advancing, with you know tests being done and often the awareness is there for this. So more and more rising incidence of adolescent PCOS. 3 to 4 percent to 19.6 percent of adolescent girls, depending upon the diagnos diagnostic cr criteria used, and the population study, it is a familial condition and heritability is approximately 70%, 24% positive family history. If you find that the mother has had PCOS, there is a good likely chance that you will see it in the daughter also. It runs in the families. In the first degree relative, daughter of a woman with PCOS have been reported to have a five-fold increased risk of developing PCOS. Now, WHO defines adolescent PCOS as the period between 10 to 19 years of age. What are the challenges that we face in diagnosis of adolescent PCOS? Why there is always a dilemma? Because in PCOS and adolescents, normal pubertal symptoms like irregular cycles, acne, seborrhea, weight gain, increased hair growth all overlap with the PCOS symptoms. And in adolescents, both menstrual irregularity and hyperandrogenism are required for diagnosis. Not recommended, well, I will be talking about it in my slides to come. Additionally, the time from menarche to full maturation of the reproductive axis can be variable. Post menarche, which may bridge young adulthood, AMH is physiologically high in adolescents. Therefore, it cannot be a marker to diagnose PCOS in these young girls. PCOS in adolescents may be the earliest manifestation of metabolic syndrome. It may later evolve or be associated with obesity, GDM, hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, endometrial hyperplasia, and malignancy in later in life. So common pitfalls, the labeling of an adolescent too early, and yet failure to identify a child who has multiple risk factors. So a very balanced approach towards, you know, picking up these girls, labeling them and counseling them, treating them and taking them forward to, to their reproductive years or perimenopausal or postmenopausal years is a whole spectrum that one needs to look at it as a gynecologist if you see them in your OPDs. <laughs> what are the risk factors? Premature puberty before eight years old, which is very often seen these days because of the diet change, climate change or other factors that are working towards it. Obesity. Family history, 
and ethnicity. It is more common in the African American population compared to the Asian, though it is not much of a difference in the incidence there also. Risk factors for assessment of PCOS, intrauterine exposure to androgen excess, intrauterine growth retardation has been reported, high BMI, insulin resistance, family history, persistence menstrual irregularity, presence of PCO on ultrasound, clinical signs of hyperandrogenism, early persistent severe, frequent relapse in acne or moderate to severe hirsutism for more than or equal to two years. It could be a progressive course, it could be a regressive one. Full blown picture of adult PCOS could be seen, but evidence is contraindicatory in this case. Risk for progress of adolescent to adult PCOS, persistent irregular cycle six years after menarche, if present, yes, it can be a full blown PCOS in adulthood. Persistent end ovulatory cycles three years after menarche and increased BMI there. Pathophysiology, we all know this theory, but I, I have still put up the slide just one second. Uh, I put up this slide because this is the basic pathophysiology of PCOS. Genes and lifestyle, there is insulin resistance of PCOS, hyperinsulinemia, where, you know, this high, how it works. So pituitary LH is high and FSH is low. So there are hormones with, with uh, mediators which are working from the liver, SHBG and uh, uh, the insulin growth factor. And the ovarian theca cells produce increased androgens. So this is the whole cycle which works towards the pathophysiology of PCOS. And we all know that the hormonal derangement in, in, with increased LH that follows the hyperandrogenemia from the theca cells, conversion is uh, deranged, and this is how it presents in PCOS. So this is again the uh, representation of this uh, two cell, two gonadotropin theory, where there is theca cell and granulosa cell where the whole derangement happens, right? Beginning from the conversion, which is deranged here. So decreased FSH, increased LH from the theca cells and then to the granulosa cells. So this is the diagnostic criteria which has been used and the Rotterdam criteria being followed at present for the adults. But when it comes to adolescent PCOS, in the last decade, there have been three, three consensus meetings, but the final decision was to follow, follow the NIH criteria of 1990. So specific and very strict criteria for adolescents remains irregular menstrual cycles plus hyperandrogenism and or hyperandrogenemia should be the only criteria when it comes to adolescent PCOS. And we cannot apply the Rotterdam criteria. AMH cannot be used because it is high physiologically there in the adolescent, so AMH marker has no value. Ultrasound cannot be done because if it is transabdominal ultrasound, the sensitivity and specificity will not be great because of the fat. And TVS cannot be done in these young girls. So transrectal is also not recommended in the guidelines. 1990, the first diagnostic criteria, as I mentioned, the 19, uh, NIH criteria is being used. Menstrual irregularities, ovulatory dysfunction, and hyperandrogenism, once other conditions that mimic PCOS have been excluded, which I will present in the end of the presentation. What are the other, diagnose, other differential diagnoses when you see PCOS and you want to rule out other reasons for it? So irregular menstrual cycles in this adolescent group, how do we define? post menarche less than one year, irregular cycles are normal because there's a pubertal transition that is happening. This axis will stabilize after some time. So more than one year, if 90 days for any one cycle, if there's a gap, this should be noted. More than one and less than three years, less than 21 or more than 45 days, this is an irregular menstrual cycle. More than three years, if it is there with less than 21 days or more than 35 days or less than eight cycles per year. This is a criteria there. Primary amenorrhea by age 15 or more than three years post thalarchy breast development. This is the definition that has been given for irregular menstrual cycles in, these, in this age group. This is again the representation of the same what I had just spoken as to how to uh, look at this uh, adolescent group. Menarche, unable to diagnose PCOS, first year post menarche, diagnose PCOS if there are irregular menstrual cycle, more than 90 days, any cycle, menstrual cycles, less than 21 days or more than 45 days. Primary amenorrhea, three years post thalarchy. Diagnose PCOS if the menstrual cycle is more than 90 days, any cycle, less than eight years, less than 21 days or more than 35 days. And hyperandrogenism is an added feature for diagnosis clinical and or biochemical. And again, repeat, do not use pelvic ultrasound for diagnosis of PCOS and ultrasound. So ultrasound and AMH, two factors, cannot be used to diagnose PCOS in this particular age group. 
isolated hirsutism acne or, and or alopecia is not diagnostic criteria severe acne no university accepted visual assessments for evaluation severe or progressive hirsutism hyperandrogenism how it has to be looked at there is a certain way of evaluating hyperandrogenism clinical features need to be first seen as to what is the type of hirsutism hyperandrogenic features that the girl has and then biochemical markers hirsutism we all know that we use the modified ferrimin and galway score nine site assessment is used in the modified ferrimin galway score more than 4 to 6 on the modified score depending on ethnicity more than 3 in white and black women more than 5 in mongoloid asian population percentage is more important than the severity alopecia of course ludwig score assess severity and distribution frontal and temporal hair loss should be noticed and hyperandrogenemia as per the ashray guidelines if clinical hyperandrogenism is unclear high quality assay should be used liquid chromatography mass spectrometry extraction chromatography immunoassay should be used direct ft assay should not be used because it has poor sensitivity accuracy and precision radiometric or enzyme linked assays but preferably liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry is what has been recommended so calculated free uh, calculated free testosterone or free androgen index or bioavailable testosterone is recommended use upper limits for reference ranges hormonal contraceptive must be off for 3 months when this evaluation uh, biochemical evaluation is done patient should not be on oral contraceptive for last 3 months so the formula they have given for free androgen index is uh, 100 by uh, 100 into uh, 100 into total testosterone upon shbg level normal range should fall between 7 to 10 ultrasound criteria should not be used in less than 8 years after menarche high incidence of multi follicular ovaries in life stages and ovarian volume should be taken up if it can be but ultrasound has just not been recommended for the adolescent pcos as a diagnosis so it should be avoided because in this picture might confuse with pco picture but this certainly does not you know ask us to label this patient with uh, adolescent pcos so this ovarian morphology may be present in uh, some of these young girls but it cannot be labeled as pcos again amh should not be used i have already spoken about it no well defined cut offs have been given and it is physiologically high in the adolescent population insulin resistance compensatory hyperinsulinemia or obesity should not be considered as diagnostic criteria for pcos in adolescents at risk of pcos if only irregular cycles or hyperandrogenism ultrasound is not indicated symptomatic treatment should be taken up regular reevaluation is important menstrual cycle reevaluation after 3 years post menarche should be done because first year it may be just a transition phase where the axis takes time to stabilize in the very first year of starting of menstruation ultrasound evaluation after only after 8 years post menarche has been recommended so how do you evaluate this uh, pcos patient clinical assessment detailed menstrual history should be noted down ask them to maintain a calendar hirsutism using uh, ferrimin modified ferrimin galway score acne you have to observe note acanthosis nigricans patches on the uh, neck the velvety patches should be noted as a sign of higher increased insulin resistance clitoromegaly alopecia and ultrasound of course has not been recommended in the adolescent group but for adults yes it is it is to be done and fsh lh testosterone prolactin tsh only for differential diagnosis it is useful and metabolic assessment will be body mass index waist hip ratio lipid profile oral gtt insulin fasting fasting and 2 hour after 75 g glucose but not in these young girls in the beginning so cutaneous evaluation will be cutaneous manifestation physical examination should document uh, terminal hair growth acne alopecia acanthosis nigricans skin tags if there are any obesity bmi calculation measurement of waist circumference should be taken note of and this was just one article which i came across quite interesting saying that you know fetal milieu affects obesity risk trouble at both ends of the birth weight spectrum when there's an iugr baby born or there's a overweight baby born both will be you know at risk of developing this pcos note down because of the body image these young girls are prone to depression screening for depression and anxiety by history and if identified referral and or treatment may be indicated because of their body image because of you know uh, acne alopecia weight gain 
these children sometimes are body shamed in their school colleges and they need to be spoken about that this is not a disease it is a genetic endowment and how to manage this uh, treatment for this adolescent pcos is very very important counseling these young girls and their mothers and the parents it's important here to note down these kind of features because this will go a long way now this is something which again the history needs to be uh, asked because this may not come forth without asking them sleep disordered breathing obstructive sleep asking them for this symptom also is important because overweight obese adolescent for symptoms suggestive of osa when identified definitive diagnosis using polysonography referred for it and they can be put up on this machine which is uh, you know utilized by these patients i forget the name of that machine which is used i just if i remember i'll talk about it uh, what was it sleep app it is uh, for sleep apnea they use a kind of a machine where there's oxygen supply given through it and you utilize it in the night when you're sleeping and it really improves your uh, you know uh, the features for this obstructive sleep apnea type 2 diabetes mellitus they are at high risk for such abnormalities and hba1 ogdt and hba1c if unable willing to complete ogdt rescreening after 3 to 5 years more frequently if central adiposity substantial weight gain and or symptoms of diabetes develop cardiovascular risk screen for cvd risk factors family history cigarette smoking hypertension dyslipidemia osa and obesity increased abdominal adiposity should be taken care of and noted down subclinical hypothyroidism thyroidism may be concealed in this this group so they should be investigated for autoimmune thyroiditis treatment will be objective symptomatic restoration of body weight cycle regulation reducing signs of hyperandrogenism prophylactic of long term health hazards later they might be prone to these kind of things they might come to you as infertility metabolic syndrome obesity diabetes and heart disease so it's a full blown spectrum which these patient these girls are going to be prone to as age advances so at risk should be treated acne obesity hirsutism and irregular cycles lifestyle therapy overweight or obese weight to 2 to 5% testosterone levels to decrease by 21% resumes regular ovulation in 50% calorie restricted diet should be advised no evidence that one type of diet is superior beneficial for both reproductive and metabolic dysfunction during adolescence an important factor that conditions the evaluation of ovarian function anti obesity medica medication again is very very uh, controversial and subjective it can be considered with lifestyle uh, considering the cost contraindication side effects availability and regulatory status it is not that you know we can prescribe these medicines straight away it's a cross referral should be taken and under supervision only if there is a gross uh, need for it right as a first line management uh, for obesity it is not advisable exercise improves weight loss reduces cv risk factors diabetes risk 60 minutes per day moderate to vigorous intensity three times per week muscle and bones uh, strengthening now counseling this kind of a thing just telling them will not work it has to be a very intelligent counseling on this as to you know what is her schedule what is her hobby ask her to join you tell her to exercise she will say okay fine will not adhere to it so one sport maybe in school or after school one hobby one sports club she can join and somewhere or the other if in her daily routine it can be fixed by walking to school or coming back walking or evening some activity where you know it ensures that it is her hobby as well as she does it with her own will will be the way to counsel instead of just telling her do this exercise so it will have to be incorporated in her day to day lifestyle so exercise interventions we all know about but in this group particularly it won't work just telling them the exercise at this much minutes or this much calories i think it needs to be incorporated by the mother or by somebody to help her out or the counseling has to be a little more tactful than it can be for an adult pcos avoiding alcohol smoking psychological stresses in normal weight girls prevent prevention of weight gain monitoring of weight increasing physical activity and effective in reducing the development of metabolic syndrome if she is not overweight when she has come and been labeled as adolescent pcos so the differential diagnosis that i was talking about i have put up in this chart form evaluation for uh, adrenal hyperplasia congenital adrenal hyperplasia 17 hydroxy progesterone early morning if levels less than 200 nanogram per deciliter ch is excluded if more than that 
200, more than 200 ACTH stimulation test can be taken up. If it is normal, it is 21 hydroxylase deficiency is excluded. If it is abnormal, it is more than 1000 nanogram per deciliter. CEH can be labeled because presentation would be overlapping clinically. Then this is what has to be taken up. Evaluation for DHES, it has limited role, but then here DHES can be used only when there is specific for adrenals. So less than 300 microgram per deciliter, it's normal. 300 to 700 PCOS or CH, more than 700 suspect adrenal tumors. First line of pharmacological therapy, CO, uh, combined oral contraceptive pill alone. But there are cases where there are younger girls where the bone uh, epiphysis is, closure has not happened. There you can also use only progestin seven to 10 days or even cyclical progestins can be used should be considered in an adolescent uh, first line as COCP with clear diagnosis of PCOS for management of clinical hyperandrogenism and or irregular menstrual cycles. Who are at risk but not yet diagnosed with PCOS for management of uh, clinical hyperandrogenism and irregular menstrual cycles. BMI, if less than 35 kilogram per meter square with no specific metabolic and or CV abnormalities, any type, choice according to the preference of the physician and patient specific clinical characteristics of the patients to be considered coc should be prescribed with caution because there is a side effect of it also so which one to use how to use we will talk about it if contraception is needed alternative measures such as progestin only methods can also be considered no cocp preparation is superior use lowest effective dose 20 to 30 microgram of ethanol estradiol or equivalent uh, cocp it con COCP containing levonorgestrel, norethestrone, or norgestimate uh, associated with lowest risk of DVT. So 35 micrograms, 30 to 35 micrograms of ethanol estradiol plus ciprotone acetate is not the first line in PCOS because it has higher DVT risk. Should only be used when treating moderate to severe hirsutism or acne, most androgenic progestin, levonorgestrel, norethestrone, low androgenicity, norgestimate, and uh, desogestrel. Progestins with anti-androgenic activity should be uh, taken in, drosperidone and CPA and Dinogest. Second line pharmacological therapies will be COCP combined with metformin. It should be considered with management of metabolic features where COCP plus lifestyle does not achieve goals. Could be considered in adolescent PCOS where BMI is more than 25 kg per meter square. COCP plus anti-androgens can be considered after 6 to 12 cosmetic treatment plus COCP. If they fail to reach hirsutism goals with androgenic alopecia, anti-androgens reduce exce uh, androgen excess features more than metformin in monotherapy. Spironolactone is the most commonly used one, but it's level C evidence there. Anti-androgens should be used when contraceptive measures are guaranteed. Metformin should be considered in adolescents with clear diagnosis of PCOS, at-risk symptoms of PCOS before diagnosis is made. Most useful when BMI is high, and high risk in high risk uh, patients with uh, metabolic syndromes. Metformin does not promote weight loss in obese adolescent PCOS. In overweight or obese adolescent with PCOS, beneficial effects have been seen. In non-obese adolescents with PCOS and hyperinsulinemia, it improves ovulation and testosterone levels. Inositol should be considered experimental in this particular age group. It is of not of much use. Duration of COCP or metformin not yet been determined unless the patient is gynecologically mature, that is five years post-menarche or has lost a substantial amount of excess weight. To conclude, I would say that diagnosis is important. Early and accurate diagnosis is essential. Criteria for the diagnosis differ from used for adult, irregular menstruation plus moderate to severe hyperandrogenism and or hyperandrogenemia, clinical or biochemical, clinical and or biochemical. Exclusion of other causes of hyperandrogenism with menstrual irregularities to be looked into. Metabolic, cardiovascular risk, psychological, dermatological. Treatment should be individualized depending upon age, symptoms, risk factor, and choices. First line should be lifestyle modification along with uh, combined oral contraceptive pills. Second line could be adding of metformin where there's metabolic syndrome there. And antiandrogens only if hirsutism features are there. And metformin alone has not been advised. Thank you so much. So picking up of this uh, adolescent girls and thank you, them, thank and you. them, it goes a long way. 
Thank you, Dr. Jyoti Bali, for such an elaborate, exhaustive, and informative talk. I am really happy to witness and to chair this your session. Full of knowledge, full of updates, and how to predict, how to diagnose the rotor criteria and the FG score. You rightly said four to six is diagnostic, not more than eight, but which was the old uh, theory. And also, you have told us the risk of PCOS. Every alternate girl is nowadays coming with metabolic syndrome, PCOS, and how to diagnose it, what is the treatment, when to use metformin, when not to use COCPs, to, uh, how to avoid DVTs and whatnot. Everything you have managed and you have you have also given emphasis on lifestyle modification and how weight loss will help her achieve better, um, avoid uh, the risk of uh, having other complication. You have already also told in emphasize that sonography is not of use and AMA should not be given that much importance like uh, adult uh, PCOS patient. So I'm really happy to witness an exhaustive, elaborate presentation of adolescent PCOS, which is just the tip of iceberg we are uh, at present uh, um, uh, witnessing in the society. The, all the uh, mothers and uh, girls are really worried and the depression is uh, mounting in lips and bounds. And it is really a social stigma for them. And it is a social problem nowadays uh, of NCPs that NCDs, one of them is PCOS, adolescent PCOS, it should be looked forward and we should um, encourage the parents and the girls also to, um, uh, to have good motivation and pharmacology, pharmacological support is very, very important. Spinal tank acts very well on these hirsutism patients and you have also um, given emphasis on CAT, that is, C CH, that is very, very which was very, very important to notify the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pratik Tambe for giving me the opportunity. And thank you, Dr. Jyoti Bali. Really, I'm really happy to chair your session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vatsha Baste. Pratika, would you like to share your screen? Dr. Tarini, can you please introduce the next speaker? 